All right, I think we're going to get started now. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out to this event today. And uh, got a great speaker coming up right now, Tony, with uh, American Airlines. So thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. Nod your head if you can't hear me. All right, so uh, thank you, Evan. First of all, uh, thanks to uh, Unity Aerospace um, for all of us that are alumni that had the opportunity to come back and speak. Um, we don't take it very lightly. We're very, very um, proud to be here and to speak with you guys. I mean, you guys are the ones that we're all going to be flying with, hopefully, the next couple of years, um, kind of the future of it. And um, so we'll, we'll kind of go over some stuff. I have a little stuff about kind of my journey, my, my path, um, some of the different jobs I've done. Is that bad? Sorry. I'll stop moving. Um, We'll leave some keys to success. So I actually used a whiteboard. Do you guys want to use that? I think you guys kids all have like iPhones and stuff now. Who here has never used a whiteboard? All right, good. We're still teaching them the right things then. Well done, Dan. All right, so who's ever seen this quote, the harder I work, the luckier I get? Where have you seen it? You can't answer, Dan. You can't answer either. At the Ralph. At the Ralph, right? So great alumni Ralph Engelstead said that, right? You think that's about hockey? Maybe. I think it's about life. I think it's about a career. I think it's about relationships. Yeah, so work really hard. Do you, think, do you work really hard when you go through a stage? Who here is in 414? How's that stage? Right. You just show up and just do it and hope it works out? Right, so I, li I live my life by that. It's everywhere in my house. Um, resilience, you guys have all heard of resilience. We'll touch on that today. Uh, um, a call to adventure. Who here wants to be a professional pilot? Who here doesn't want to fly airplanes for a living? All right, we got one person that's going to have a real job. Uh, mentorships and relationships, we'll touch on that and how important they are, hence why I'm here. Um, and then hashtag UND Proud. You guys do all that Instagram-y, chappy snatch stuff, right? So um, that's a thing I see all over Instagram, and I, I think it, it resonates with a lot of us at how proud we are to be, be from here. So we'll get into it. So that's me. That's no longer my title. When this set up with Sam, and I'll get into how I got invited here, uh, but I, I had this title of Senior Manager of Safety and Efficiency. Um, what that did, or what that did, uh, currently does now. Uh, basically, we ran all of flight safety at American Airlines. So you guys know what FOQA is? Flight data monitoring. Our LOSA program, which you guys may or may not know of. Basically, you have pilots in the flight deck observing what does not go well in the flight deck. But they're not, they're not a supervisor pilot. They're not a check airman. They're just line pilots collecting data for us. How well are pilots manage threat and air management? And then we have our, um, and there's also our learning improvement team, which is a safety two concept, which we won't get into. But basically, managing the data. So a quick couple of icebreakers. So we have FOQA. So when a, when a pilot exceeds some aircraft limitation at our airline, if it's egregious, part of our partnership with our, our union, we have pilots that work for the union that will call those pilots and say, hey, we saw you did this on XYZ flight into this airport. Can you tell us about it? And they'll open up, right? Because it's all non-punitive. We want to understand what could have gone better for them. And it's a, it's a learning opportunity for the airline to maybe change policies and procedures, but also a learning opportunity for the, the pilot. So Gatekeeper says, um, unstable approach in LA, or LAS. You guys know where LAS is? Las Vegas? All right. This was the response. This is real. So, all right, good. It's meant to laugh. They are all de-identified, de I promise. I can't tell you who it was. And this one, FO's comments why he continued unstable approach. Two dots high, VRF plus 22, sinking at 1,500 feet per minute and idle thrust. Does that sound like a place we want to be? No. True story. <laughs> so we all make mistakes, and it's OK. We learn from them. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll touch on kind of my, my path since UND. I'm not going to get into where I was born and my mom's name and all that stuff. Um, if you saw my little bio, I think Evan asked me to write a bio, and I, I kind of wrote it jokingly that my name is Tony, but some people call me Captain. At American Airlines, we're a very Captain-centric airline, so I'm always introduced as Captain Androsky, and I, I really don't like that. Uh, I'm a big believer that you never let your role define you. I'm just Tony, right? I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a friend. I'm a pilot. I do play pilot sometimes. Sometimes I'm in the left seat. Sometimes I'm in the right seat. But that's not who I am, right? That's that's or jobs I do. So that's kind of my joke. I'm just I'm just Tony. Um, Graduate here in 2003, like most of you will do soon. Sorry, don't boo me. I couldn't get in-state tuition, so I went to Riddle and got my master's in um, basically a focus in human factors, which led to some of my safety work. Um, these are the aircraft I've flown. Who here has ever heard of a Dash 8? All right, cool. Whew. Good. I know you guys won't ever fly a turboprop. I'm so sorry. Um, so I flew a Dash 8 at Piedmont, flew CRJ 200 at Air Wisconsin. Um, went to US Airways, flew the 190, recession hit, got furloughed, went to Compass, flew the 175. 
uh, for about two years. Got came back to U.S. Airways. Now what have I flown? 190, 73, 3 and 400. Airbus, Max, 800. Now back to the Airbus. That covers it all, right? And then 2008, uh, sorry, not 2008, what year? 2013, uh, U.S. Airways and American Airlines decided to merge and form the world's largest airline. So now with American. Um, so I've sat in the, had the privilege of being a check airman on the 190, which is really cool. You know, you're running simulators, you're sitting in the right seat, the left seat, on the jump seat, and you get to learn all the jobs so well, right? So I could be in the right seat with a brand new captain, or I could be in the right seat with a captain who's been here 35 years. Or I get to be in the left seat flying with one of you guys who's, holy smokes, this is my first flight in the 190. Good luck, right? And that's always really, really fun. Um, and I'm currently doing that on the Airbus 320 right, uh, right now as of two months ago. Uh, I was a chief pilot in Dallas, Fort Worth for uh, just about four years. Kind of went through the COVID pandemic with that, which is always a fun job. Uh, the chief pilot role in an airline is always something that's probably nobody knows what they do. They always say you spend 90% of your time with 10% of your bad pilots. There's always people that are your lower performers, right? But you understand why they're not performing where they need to be, right? Something, something's going on in their life. It's a financial crisis, a marital issue, there's death in the family, there's addiction going on. So the chief pilot really is a human being that engages with the pilots on everything, make sure their, their pay is correct, make sure that they're, they're where they need to be personally and professionally to make sure they can go fly the aircraft safely. Uh, a very rewarding job, but a very tasking job because you're always on call, right? So at two in the morning, Evan's like, hey man, my, um, my son just broke out of rehab, what do I do? I don't know, but we're gonna figure it out. You, know, you just have anything, or hey, I didn't get paid correctly, and you can get that phone call at three in the morning. But to him, him not getting paid correctly at three in the morning is the most important thing. So my job is to make sure that his needs are met. So, very fun job. And then uh, I was asked to come do some safety work out, you know, based on my, my master's degree with human factors and some of the research I had done. I uh, got called to do the LOSA lit and the FOCA and the efficiency piece. Our airline, as big as we are, uh, I don't know if, if you were here to, um, to listen to the previous speaker about efficiency in large, large uh, corporations and small corporations. The downside of being the largest airline is we're like the Titanic. We're not going to sink, I promise. Um, but we're trying to avoid those, um, those icebergs. But we, it's just so hard to make change. It's something so big, right? You have so many different layers of bureaucracy um, and so many different departments. So our efficiency group is, um, was developed to kind of go find better ways of business. Um, why do we do everything this way? If we always answer, it's the way we've always done it, that's probably not the right answer. We should be constantly evolving, whether it's a checklist, it's a procedure, it's where we buy product from, it's how we engage with our customers, it's how we train our pilots. Really fun stuff. Um, all right, enough about me. Who here has ever heard of American Airlines? Who, wait, who here has never flown on an American Airlines flight, either Eagle or Mainline? All right, a fair number, right? Uh, up here is kind of Northwest uh, Delta Airlines territory. They own this place, which is awesome. They're a great airline. Um, and my intention is not to tell you that any airline is bad or good. I'll just tell you my experience of what I know of the airline I work at that I'm very proud to work at. So here's who we are, Fort Worth, Texas. Not Dallas, most people think we're based in Dallas, we're in Fort Worth, but everybody knows where Dallas is. So what's cool about we call it the Metroplex, you have Fort Worth, you have Dallas, and you have the airport right in the middle. Um, so we're kind of right there at the airport. How many runways does DFW have? Anybody know? Anybody? Six. Six? Seven. Seven. Seven runways. You even know how big the biggest runway is? God, he's so smart. Yeah, really big runway. We've got a lot of acreage. It's Texas, everything's huge. It's really neat to see when you fly in there. You can fly into a place like LaGuardia or to Boston or even to um, Chicago O'Hare, insanely busy. And it's just like, you can't get lost. But you come into like a place like Denver or Dallas, you're like, you get on the ground and now the danger begins. Like, where do I, f you know, it's like acres and acres of land to try to find a gate. It's a really fascinating airport. Uh, all right, we talked about world's largest airline, so we'll talk about our airplanes we have. 737, um, A832F, that's what we call our Airbus. We have 17 variations of the Airbus between the 319, 320, 321, depending on what motor we have, what wing we have on it, if it's basic, enhanced, or neo. And we're delivering a new model next year. It's, it's insane. But we're the world's largest operator of the Airbus. Um, over 500 narrow body Airbus aircraft right now. Uh, 777, 78. Uh, and this is what we kind of went through during the pandemic how much of a change we had. And this is kind of my piece on resiliency. Um, one of the previous speakers, who's a good friend of mine, spoke earlier today. We were out with some SAMA guys last night um, at Blue Moose and, and then Bonzers. And I actually learned what the loft was. That was interesting. Um, all of you have the opportunity to be owned by an airline right now, which is fantastic, right? Who here is already committed to some airline? I see a lot of hands. 
Who here is looking at airline options? Everybody's looking at options, right? I think when a lot of us came out of here in that 03, 04 time frame, post 9-11, um, it, there wasn't a whole lot of hope out there. Like, man, I, I just want to go anywhere that will hire me, right? We didn't have the internet either, so we kind of applied through FedEx and fax machines and stuff. But you didn't have the ability to have these tools that you have now, which is awesome. So make sure you're, you're doing good work and understanding where you're going, because you get to make a choice, which is phenomenal. Um, so speaking of resilience, going back to the pandemic, we're sitting there and everything's great. We're booming, we're hiring 700 pilots a, a, a year, and life is good, we're gonna retire people, and then, oh wait, COVID hits, right? You're watching the TSA numbers come down. And we're looking at, I'm a chief pilot in Dallas, we're looking at flight 125, that's our daily flight to Hong Kong with the 777-300, you know, 16 and a half hour flight. It's our flagship flight. We make so much money on, and we're very proud of. Um, pilots stopped, refused to start flying there because they were worried. You know, hey, CDC saying this, CNN saying this, we, were, we had no idea. And when we saw one of our Czech airmen call in sick, he was unwilling to go, we all looked at each other, this is real, right? Nobody wants to go. And the next day we started canceling China, Beijing, or sorry, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, Narita. All of a sudden Asia was gone, Australia was gone. Then all of a sudden President Trump says, hey, we're shutting down Europe. We're like, oh my gosh, right? That's a huge market for us. Our biggest partner is British Airways based in London. How can we not fly to London? How can we not get pastures to wherever from Europe? And it was just like, things started going crazy. Our organization had to adapt very, very quickly. And I think, you know, United did it well, Delta did it well, and I think we did it well. Sp uh, Spirit, Frontier, every airline managed it differently. Well, we did. We took an opportunity to get rid of the A330, which I don't know, we had 40 of them, maybe. Pretty much all based on the East Coast doing Europe flights. 757, probably one of the greatest aircraft ever made. I never got a flight, but for those that flew it, loved it. It flew to some very unique markets, so we like, lost some markets because we couldn't fly that aircraft anymore. 7.6 as well, we lost a lot of our European destinations that we couldn't justify flying a 777 or 7.8 to. But hey, we don't have any 7.6s anymore. They're old, they burn a lot of gas. And with more fleets, it's harder to train pilots. When you're either furloughing pilots or hiring pilots, you want the least amount of number of uh, aircraft types for training efficiencies, right? Look at Southwest, they got one. Life is really good. All you're worried about is left seat or right seat. We had nine at one point, and that's left seat or right seat. You start looking at how people bid and change, it just became a huge cost. So our, uh, our leadership decided, then we retired the 190. So we lost those four fleets overnight, and right before the pandemic, we just right, retired our Super 80. So anybody that remember the old Mad Dog, which was a really cool airplane. Um, so that's kind of what we were in American uh, going through the pandemic, 350 destinations. This is current-ish. So those come and go. I think we announce a new de destination every other month right now because the pandemic's over, right? All of a sudden we're not wearing masks anymore. It's fascinating because I came up here on Tuesday, that was the first day, and I walked into the airport for the first time in two and a half years. And I just, I'm not I'm saying masks are good or bad. Uh, it was uncomfortable. I didn't know how to act. I'm like, oh my gosh. Because the last two and a half years, I'm gonna get like tackled if I don't have a mask on. But it was freeing in a way, right? That it, not that we're getting rid of the mask, but that we're, we're moving beyond this, right? This resilience that I talk about, the willingness and ability mentally and physically to, to withstand change and, and be beaten down and say, oh my God, am I gonna have a job? Am I going to a new airplane? Am I gonna have a paycheck? Can I provide for my family? Or for you guys, none of that matters yet, right? Because you're just all excited to go fly airplanes, which is awesome. Will I have a job? Like, or am I gonna be stuck at UND for three years, right? <laughs> three additional years. Um, so we came out of it, uh, 350 destinations, 50 countries, which is pretty phenomenal. Now you add in our networks with our One World Alliance and just, poof, it expands of where we can go. Um, when we see our network planning team talk about what American Airlines can do with the passenger, our, our most profitable route is Little Rock, Arkansas to Dallas. I have no idea why. They got into the, the details, so basically Little Rock to Dallas, Dallas will connect to London, London connect to any continent, right? So we can, t we can hit Delhi, we can hit Johannesburg, we can hit somewhere in Zimbabwe through those partnerships. So, but somebody's not paying us just for that one leg. You know, it's on an Envoy jet. It's not even American Airlines. It's one of our subsidiaries. But that's our most profitable route, was Little Rock to Dallas. This is pre-pandemic. So it's kind of neat to watch the airline, understand what your airline really does. For those of you that go to a regional, like most of you will first, understand what you're providing to that carrier, right? You're not your own airline. You're part of a network, right? When you look at the One World Alliance, you see American, that incorporates all of our, our, our partnerships, wholly owned and non wholly owned, uh, just like Delta does with the Sky Team. Oh, wait, I'm supposed to push a, um, a video. So we'll talk about, um, I was fortunate, let's talk about relationships. There we go, that's how we'll start it. Um, I've known Kim Kenville for a long time. Who's, who, who knows Kim Kenville? So she was my advisor when I was here. Who knows Leslie Keene? Sorry, Leslie Martin. 
Sorry, I knew Leslie before her and Chad got married. Um, Leslie was my 221 instructor, sorry, 222 instructor. Matt Upsall, anybody know him? 221 instructor. So Kim, Kim and I have had, have had a relationship for the last 20 years, just amazing. Anything I, ha I had in Grand Forks, anything I needed, she was always there for me, guidance or whatever. Life, we talk hockey, she's a huge hockey fan, I'm a huge hockey fan, and I still see her at every home hockey game. My wife and I are season ticket holders for the Sioux games. Um, when we travel to go watch the Sioux play somewhere, I run into Kim all the time. So we talk about relationships and mentorship. Kim was a huge mentor of mine, and still is to this day. Um, so I, I was at a safety conference in October in Pittsburgh, and they said, hey, you, the universities are here. I was excited, NTSB, FAA, American, we're presenting, we're showing data, like true data. I'm like, why is UND here? You know, I, they don't belong here, right? This is like an industry thing. So I was fascinated, I reached out to Kim, she said, hey, give Brandon Wilde a call, one of our professors. So I engaged with Brandon, and I had no idea, you guys have folk on your airplanes. So I came up for a visit, he invited me to speak at a class, he showed me the whole air data monitoring, the GE stuff, and I'm like, that's what we use in American. You guys are equipped, what I know at 20 years in the industry, you guys know now. Those aircraft are the same thing, that's the same stuff that's on your Archers or what on, or is on my Airbus. So I spoke at the class with Brandon, at the very end of it I said, hey, you know, I'm always, I'm always available to people that want to engage on mentorship and advice. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you my experiences and I can give you ideas. I think that's very, very important as you, as you go forward in a career to never, to never stop giving back to help, you know, going back to UND Proud, right? I want to make sure this place succeeds, and the only way it succeeds is by you guys succeeding. Um, sorry, do you guys know these people? Um, so at the end of the class, you guys know Ed Clancy? Anybody know Ed? Director of travel for uh, SAMA. He's the only guy that came up to me and said, hey man, you know, he introduced me, just very put together professional young man and said, hey, uh, I'm the travel director, it's really great meeting you. We started chatting. I was like, oh, where are you guys gonna go? He's like, oh, I think we're gonna go to Endeavor. And no, no, no knock to Endeavor, but I said, why would you go to Endeavor when you come to American Airlines? So it was really cool. Was it November? We went to Endeavor. Now, when did we meet, November? Yeah. So November of last year, we had this conversation. It led to a couple of breakfasts at Darcy's. It led to lots of emails, lots of phone calls. Just Ed and I kind of figuring out, right, two dudes, two guys. From, from UND Aerospace, one 20 years older, one 20 years younger, um, trying to give those that wanted to go an opportunity to come look at the world's largest airline. So Ed's like, can you do it? I said, I think so. We got COVID protocols, but I mean, I know some people, let me go ask. So I went right to our vice president of flight, I said, hey, my alma mater, they have this great organization, they travel, they want to see the airline, these are our future pilots. He's like, rock on, let's do it, man. Uh, we didn't buy him tickets, of course. Um, we're too cheap for that. But we offered up, we, basically I was given a golden key from our vice president, our senior vice president of flight to say, bring him down, whatever we gotta do, we'll do. So we had this great plan, and then, uh, when was that, February what? You're supposed to know these things. Middle of February, we'll call it, 20th maybe? It's nice and cold up here, right? Big blizzard comes through, flights start canceling. So I give a huge credit for all the guys, came, guys and gals came down to Dallas. I think the first day, instead of having 20, we end up getting one, two, three, is that six or seven? Um, come down, and then more in the evening, more the next day. So we're really fortunate the first day, um, all of them had the opportunity to have a, a behind the scenes tour of the world's uh, largest airlines, biggest hub, um, with a look into our hub control center, which is a little mini control center in every hub we have that directs all the pushes, all the delays, all the um, catering, any maintenance issues. It's really the brain behind the airline that designs or dictates what happens at the airline on a daily basis. Uh, and that was all facilitated by our director of flight, which is basically our head chief pilot in Dallas, uh, a, a fascinating um, man who's been, who's hired in America in 1990, just gave his undivided time to, to the students. Um, and we were able to engage with all the chief pilots. And then, where'd we go after that, that day? Museum. Oh, then we got a private tour of our C.R. Smith Museum, which is a, a heritage museum for all of the American Airlines. And this is a piece of it. It's an old MD-80 sim that you can go in there and kind of play with and learn everything of the airline. You know, our airline started, you know, over 100 years ago. And you look at all the airlines that have merged to create what we are right now. And there's airlines out there you've never heard of. And there's airlines I've never heard of. Um, most people never heard of U.S. Airways, right? I'm guessing a lot of you probably don't know who they are. But you look back at TWA, Ozark, Reno, AirCal, um, P original Piedmont Airlines, original PSA Airlines that merged with U.S. Airways in 1988 to form the new U.S. Airways, not the regional version, right? I mean, it's just fascinating, and everybody was able to immerse themselves with that. Um, and then we have a DC-3 in there, an old classic DC-3 from Amer one of our first airplanes. Um, 
So that's our flagship. We do all of our pilot hiring here. We do retirement uh, ceremonies here. It's very special for all of us to do anything there. So it's really special for us to share that with um, the SAMA group. This is not open on, on the weekday, so it was open just to UND uh, for those that made it down. Um, second day was really neat. We followed up at our, at our new corporate headquarters, which is called Skyview 8. If you want to see an, an amazing building, Google Skyview 8 American Airlines. It's, it's like the Google of the world. So. Uh, for those of us that all worked at airlines, you kind of work in a building that's just white halls, government kind of feel. Um, and our CEO at the time said, if we're going to build new headquarters, how do we recruit the best talent? You know, how, do we, how do we get those best people? Well, pilots are easy. You pay them a lot, you give them free food, right? It's just what we want. That's really easy. We have no problem attracting pilots. Neither does United, neither does Delta. But how do we get the best network planning? How do we get the best IT people? How do we get the best safety analysts, right, that we're competing with all of our peers with? So let's build, an air, let's build a, a campus that gives you like the Google Starbucks feel. So that's what we're kind of working on. Uh, yes, we have that too. Uh, so we built this really great um, facility and we kicked the day off with our Vice President of Flight coming to speak. And I think there's Chip right now. He's our Vice President of Flight, um, which was really cool. So we were able to present. Um, we couldn't get one with a Sioux head, but we gave him a, a Fighting Hawks um, mug, both of them. The president, the vice president of, sorry, vice president of flight, senior vice president of flight, and the vice president of safety all came and engaged that day. Um, so kind of, again, behind the, scene to, behind the scenes tour of what American Airlines headquarters is. And our airline is very big on openness. And you know, the, you've heard of open door policy. We have no doors. I mean, there's so much stuff with, without doors there. You just walk around. We have a video arcade, shuffleboard, ping pong, pool table. The idea that if you're at work, you can still have fun. Hey, if you're working on something really hard, go relax your brain and then come back, right? It's a way different mentality than most places are. Um, so it's really, really neat to see that. Um, when our vice president of safety came in um, and we told her that there's a SAMA conference and American Airlines wasn't there, but FedEx was there, United was there, Delta was there. She was very upset, right? That's not something. So I think that's a commitment from American that we want to engage more with UND um, because it, it's fair to you to understand what we have to offer. Right? I, I think that's important for all of us as alumni. Not to say that you should come to American, but you know what, what we are and what we're behind. Not just that we have, we have a bunch of airplanes that are really big and we'll pay you a lot of money. But guess what, Delta does that too, United does that too. So we're hoping to get a little bit further in that commitment of supporting the SAMA group. Oh, we had more people in the second day finally because the ice storm started, started to fall apart. Uh, and then later in that day, we were able to go to our IOC, which is basically where we operate the airline, right? Crew scheduling, dispatch, weather, uh, aircraft routing, really where when you're a pilot out there, they're going to call you and say, this is what you're going to do now. Um, and that was a COVID lockdown up until, I guess, yesterday. Um, we were able to finagle their senior vice president of flight to have come in and have a briefing. Um, and our senior vice president of flight, uh, Captain Kimball Stone, spent an hour with the SAMA group, which was really, really cool. Any questions asked? I mean, it was, it was really neat to see. And, I, and I'll give a, a lot of credit to, to all you. What I've seen both with the SAMA group coming down and what I've seen here today with um, the last couple of days I've been up here watching you guys. You guys are well along your way. You know, your ability to be professional, ask great questions. Um, some of the questions that the, <laughs> the SAMA group asked our VP and senior v VP of safety and flight, I'm like, oh my god. That's a tough one. I don't know if that's like a, an appropriate question, but it was well handled so well, and, and that's a compliment that you guys are very confident. I, I think are confident and confident in your ability to to get that message across, and I think that comes back down to what you and the airspace is all about. Continues to provide provide what it provided me an amazing foundation. Who here loves the state checks the way we do them here? No hands, right? Yeah, I didn't like them either. Do you think that it's going to pay off at some point? I promise you. I saw a buddy of mine sent me an a Instagram and there's a guy who said, hey, 3,486 two days since elementary school and I've never played the recorder. I promise you're going to look back in my, in my career in 20 years, I've never had a state check like UND at an airline. I've had some really, really, really tough and rigorous training, but no, nothing was ever came to the level of a state check at UND. You know why? It's not because we don't expect a lot from our pilots at an airline. It's because it was so hard here, I built that foundation of how to get through it, right? Those like Kim Kenbill, you know, Leslie Martin, and Matt Upsell that ingrained that in me in day one, that that's the way we operate. And that goes back to that quote, right? The harder I work, the luckier I'm going to get. So if I work really hard, will I pass every stage check? I hope so. But do you think somewhere in your career you're going to have a hiccup? You might, right? Something's going to get in your way. It might be a mistake. It might be something else going on in your brain, right? You're having something else in your personal life. Maybe you're just not on your A game. And that's okay. 
It's how we deal, it, we deal with that adversity that's gonna make you successful. And I think that's what UND is still trying to do. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to put on into, into this presentation, um, that resilience piece. And I have this thing up here, call to adventure. There's this um, idea that was written back in like the 1400s of a hero's journey, and I won't get into it because it gets into the psychiatry. And I, I steal it for all of you that were in Dallas, I'm gonna steal Chip Long's thing. So Chip, this is Chip Long, our Vice President of Flight. He does, he says, he talks every new hire class. So every week right now, we're bringing in 45 new pilots. It's 180 pilots a month. It's a massive amount of number, a massive number. So he has this quote, um, a hero's journey. The idea is that you're a man or a woman at home just doing your thing, right? And this is 1400, so not like your current home. Um, and there's a calling to go out and do something more. And a call to adventure is us as pilots, right? Why do you want to be a pilot? Name something. Because it's fun. Right. What else? Travel. Travel. What else? Money, money. Well, <laughs> all right. Agreed, right? You'll never work a day in your life as an airline pilot unless you tell yourself you're working, right? It's, it's not a job. It's a career. It's fun. It's exciting. It's a sense of adventure. And that's our calling, right? That's, that's us. Now, we're not heroes. We do an amazing job. But we're not heroes. Those that land in rivers after hitting Canadian geese are heroes. That's not me. That's the one. <laughs> so, um, so our call to adventure is to go out there. Now, how do we get there? You have to go out there and slay some dragon, right? You're going to be you're going to be out there in the 1400s with your sword, and everything's trying to kill you, right? Now, you and D, everybody's trying to kill you, right? You're trying to get through. You know, if you're a fraternity or sorority, you're trying to get through rushing. You're trying to get your your grades. You're trying to get, deal with your parents, your girlfriends or boyfriends. You're telling your friend, oh, I can't go to the loft tonight, I got a stage tomorrow, and you're like, oh, that's really tough, right? And then you have the stage checks, right? And that's that dragon that's out there, that's always out there. And that's okay, there's always gonna be a dragon out there, but we're gonna go out there and slay it. So this is the quote, I love it. It says, it's worthwhile to go find the dragon in its lair instead of waiting for it to come and eat you. So who here has been afraid to do something? I don't live with regrets, but I have one regret in life. Well, one thing I wish I wouldn't have done. So I played hockey my whole life, and I was always a Sioux hockey fan, and then I found out they had an aviation program. So I came up here my junior year, my sophomore year, to, to speak with coaches, you know, some slight recruitment. They said, you're good, but you're not that good. But we, we offer a walk-on for our third goalie every year. We only, we only invite two. We're inviting you and one other guy. So all you have to do is show up and perform and beat this guy, right? And you'll, you'll play one game every year, you'll let her, you'll play the first game against Manitoba, you'll get one period. I'm like, I don't care, that sounds awesome, right? Put the Fighting Sioux jersey on. You know what I did? I didn't show up. I was scared. I didn't want to slay that dragon. Biggest regret of my life. It worked out well, right? I've become a, I think, successful airline pilot. But that's one of those things, don't ever be afraid to go do something you want to go do. Right, I, when I go to the hockey games now, I'm like, man, how cool would it have been? I'll never know. So don't ever let those opportunities pass you up. And that goes back into the mentorship relationships here. I like to think I made a great impact and built some lifelong relationships with about 20, how many do we have, 16? I can't count anymore. I had a church fan, I couldn't count them all. We're like counting heads, getting them in and out, so. Um, oh, sorry, we looked at simulators, we did, we, we did so much. Um, that's very, very important. So it's important on myself, on Dan, Mike, Rob, some of the other alumni that are here to engage with you to build relationships like I have with some of these kids here or I have with Kim Kenville or I have with Leslie Martin to help you get where you want to be, right? I can't do the work for you. I, can't, I can hand you a sword or say, hey, this is how I sharpen my sword, but I can't, I can't do it for you. I can give you advice um, based on my experiences, good and bad, and let you make a great decision. And UND is going to give you a great foundation. Oh yeah, when you're a pilot, you got to learn how to, all of our pilots and flight attendants, they have to go learn how to get in the slide and swim, so. Bring your trunks, don't be shy. Um, so, and then the other part of that, that's one thing for all of us that are older that have graduated that are now in the, in, you know, quote unquote living the dream. Now it's up to you, are you gonna engage with us? Because I'm not gonna walk around and say, hey, I'm Tony, what's your name? I'm Josh. Hey Josh, can I be your mentor? I'm not gonna <laughs> do that, right? That's not my job, right? But if you wanna come up to me and talk to me, I'll absolutely talk with you and we'll see where that goes from there, right? So please do that. So I know I see Rob Frank, who's also an American Airlines captain back there, who's semi-paying attention. Is Mike Dennison still here? He's somewhere. He's a 787 instructor at United, also from our era. Guess what? Dan Malott's a really great experienced person with tons of experience. You know, your instructors here, are, your instructors, um, 
your faculty, engage with them, ask them questions, right? Learn from them. Just like when you get to the airline, are you just gonna sit there in the right seat and never learn from the guys next to you? No, right, you're gonna learn good and bad from those next to you, and that's part of it. And it, it's not, hey, will you be my mentor? That will develop over time with relationships, because you may not need anything from me. Just because I'm a, a captain at the world's largest airline, woo, my experiences may not apply to the dragon you need to slay today, right? But somebody here does. Oh, guess what, you have a bunch of people next to you that you can learn from them too? Absolutely, lifelong relationships. You know, um, Rob Frank back there, also, he was our first speaker this morning. I knew who he was because he worked in dispatch and I didn't like him because I didn't know him. But I'm like, oh, he's one of those dispatch guys. He never gives me the airplane I want. Back then we didn't have GPS in all the airplanes. He always give me the one without the GPS. I'm like, come on, dude, just give me the, give me the 430. Um, anyways, but then we became dear friends in new hire class at Piedmont, right? We had that same foundation of UND. We both wanted to succeed. We shared the dragon, which was Piedmont training. So we slayed it together, you know, and our daughters are the same age. We've been to each other's weddings. Um, we're up here sharing a hotel room for speaking. Um, so remember that, like in this group, right? Look around and you'll have those relationships and you're gonna build them right here, which is, I think, just, just amazing. Did we cover all the points so far? Call to adventure, resiliency. What did I miss? I've been talking a lot. I'm supposed to open up some time for questions, I know that. What else did I miss, anybody? What didn't I cover? DFW SAMA folks, did I miss something? We're good. Should we open up to questions? Maybe like questions? Don't be shy. If you're shy, I'll pick on you, I promise. All right, questions? Oh, there's gotta be some. Oh, we gotta get you a mic. Holy cow. Let's make the mic mobile again. I like that idea. Which yeah, one okay. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, so you told us a little bit of the different airways you went to to finally get to American Airlines, but was that just kind of what happened or was there something that inspired you to take the certain steps? That's a great question. Who here, who here is from the Twin Cities? Right, everybody. Who here wants to work for Delta Airlines? Everybody from the Twin Cities, right? It's what it is. I went to high school, college up here, so like Northwest was like, oh my gosh, Northwest would be so cool. Um, live in the cities, but I went to high school in Western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. Huge, huge, huge base for US Air. And I'm like, oh man, that airline is always bankrupt. It's like they're, they're labor, it's like, I mean, I knew people, right? Like you always say the news, like, hey, they're bankrupt for the 18th time. They're like the cockroach, we could never die, it was great. Um, but I always wanted to work there, right? I love the way the airplanes looked. I used to skip high school and go out to the, airplane, uh, out to the airport pre 9 11, just ride the train and watch airplanes take off and land. That's how dorky I was. Um, I had my old VCR, if you guys know what that is, with the VHS tape. We used to record airplanes landing and go back and look at it. Um, so I was infatuated with US Air. Um, so when I came out of here, I had a goal of where I wanted to be, but then the opportunity to get hired at Piedmont was what it was. It was a US Airways Express, so cool, I have the flag on my tail, but that's all I knew. I didn't have, a again, like what you guys know. So you, I think the short answer is I had no idea where I was gonna be. I think that's good for all of you. For If you really wanna be a Delta, work for it, but don't forget United's a great airline, Sun Country, JetBlue, Frontier, American, whoever, they're all great airlines you all have a great career at. So the idea of I can only go this one way, if you go to Endeavor tomorrow, but then United calls you a year later and says, we'll hire you right now. Are you gonna go? I hope so, right? See where that path leads you. Or if you're at Envoy and you're not loving the feel of that airline, I mean, I worked at three regional airlines and that's just what it was in my career. I didn't wanna do that. That's just kind of where it took me. So um, I had a goal. I didn't know what that was. My goal was US Airways or Northwest and it happened but I, couldn't, I could not have plotted that out. Again, um, kind of like the harder I work, the luckier I get. The way I got my job, uh, the way I've gotten a lot of these opportunities to come do things beyond flying, is when I put my mind to something, I wanna be really, 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 really good at it. I may not be the smartest, but damn it, I'm the hardest working. It's like a poodle versus a Labrador. I'm not the poodle, I'm the Labrador, man. I'll wag my tail, smile all day, and I'll work my butt off for you to make you happy. And I've always told that my boss, my job is to make you look really good. So I've always done that, right? As an FO, I've made my captains look really good. As a captain, I make my crew look good, right? My FO, my flight attendants, my gate agents, my ground crew. You know, if they need an on-time departure, we're gonna work really hard for that. If they need a hotel room, we're gonna take care of it. So I think that's the key is just work really, really hard and your path is gonna be your path. Is gonna be your path. 
And at the end of the day, when we all turn, well, by the time you guys retire, I'll probably be like, fly till you die. Um, for me, 65 years old, 65 years old in theory, I'm going to look back and say, did I have a great career? I don't know. I went through furloughs, bankruptcies. I went through massive pay raises, pay losses. But yeah, I, f I flew jets for a living. It was the coolest job in the world. I've flown all around the world. Um, you know, I land somewhere and I'm like, cool, I got 24 hours. What, what awesome museum can I see? Or what diners, dive-ins, and drive restaurant is in this town that I can go find out and like try the hot wing challenge and make my stomach hurt, you know? I mean, just, it's so cool, right? I'm um, sorry, I, I talk a lot. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, thank okay. you, sir. You're welcome. Up front. Sweet, thank you. Um, so you said that you got your master's degree at a flight school that's south of here, yeah, um, which is all of them. But so why did you do that? So uh, funny story, for those of you that know me, I just, I just recovered from a broken leg skiing. Um, so here I am. I always thought I wanted a master's. I love learning. And I, sorry, I love learning aviation. I was not a general ed guy. English, English, I was almost a double major, but I had to leave Grand Forks. I was one semester away from a double major in English. So English and flying stuff, I love. Um, and I always talked to my wife, I said, you know, I, I want to go back and do something. You know, human factors thing, I really kind of love that. MBA sounded kind of cool. Then all my pilot buddies like, what are you going to do? You're not going to pay more money. You're just going to spend money. And, and I'm like, it's not about the money. It's about education. Nobody can take that away from you, right? That's something that you have for life. It's an investment. Um, so I got done with the trip. I'm playing roller hockey. My wife's like, well, I'll go watch you. Thank God. I had a little six-speed Jeep back then. And um, my roller brake got cut in a rut, caught in a rut. My leg kept going. So I, br I broke my right fibula. So I was out of work for three months, right? Uh, they put a screw in it, or a plate and screws, got rejected, did another surgery, got a staph infection, another surgery. It was awful. Don't, don't recommend it. So I'm sitting there in bed, bedridden, with a leg up on all sorts of whatever pills they gave me to kill the pain. And my wife's going through grad school at the time in Charleston at the Citadel, and she's just like over me. She's like, oh my god. Between teaching full time, doing night school, a Labrador running around, and you, like, go do something. Like, I'm, I don't do well with idle time. All my friends are like, oh, you have eight days off. I'm like, no, I need to do something. I just, I have to do something. So I said, I'm going to go back and get a degree. So I started researching. I kind of focused, okay, I'm going to do aviation related. So I, I called Kim. And I was like, because I think she was running the, the master's program at the time. I'm like, is there like an alumni discount? Is there an in-state tuition thing or reciprocity because I'm living in South Carolina? I'm like, nope, full out of state. I'm like, oh, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. So it broke my heart, um, and I chose Amber Riddle, which, which I'm very happy for. And they had a great, um, a great program where you have different focuses. It allowed me to go down that, like that HF path, um, where, again, I built, built some great relationships. So I engaged with a lot of our leadership at, at US Airways at the time um, of how we developed our AQP pr program. So we we're the second airline in the world to really do it. And why we got there was we had, we had, had four uh, fatal accidents in one year um, through the early 90s. Um, in Flight 427, if you don't know what U.S. Air Flight 427 was, a tragedy in Pittsburgh with a 737 rudder hard over. That was kind of our last straw. Because um, we didn't know if it was pilot error um, or Boeing issues. So we said, we got to redesign how we, how we operate, how we interact, what our policies look like, what our procedures look like. Uh, so I dorked out on that, met a bunch of people. My thesis was, you guys know what F Air 117 is? It's the rest rule, how you guys are governed by rest rules when you get to the airlines. So that was all different when we got into the airlines. So when we, about halfway through my career, all, how much you could fly in a day, how much rest you needed, all changed. So I did a, um, my thesis on a cost analysis of all of our schedules, what would have to change in the increase in pilot training. Um, and I had worked with our pilot union, our flight office on that, I've given some surveys out to our, our crews. So I just kind of met people and I was like, th this makes sense. Um, so I, from there, it's just that, those relationships I built through that, that master's degree work. It's not the master's degree that, that gets me a job, right? It's the work I did to get it. Um, and I probably could have done not that much work and just gotten A's, but it was, it was fun. So if you like work and you like learning, I mean, the, that higher level of education is huge. You know, yet, yeah, will it get you a higher pay rate at American Airlines? Nope. Nope. Will it get you a new job? Maybe. No guarantee, but it's, like I said, it's an investment in your own self, so. Yeah, I'm thank sorry, you very did much. I answer that? Yeah, those are. I know if I may have digressed a bit. I do that sometimes. <laughs> it's got to be at least one or two more. Or three or four. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Max Langard, and I was just wondering 
apart from things like the day-to-day -day operations and scheduling and pay and stuff like that, what is the culture like at American Airlines? It's interesting because I, I think, yeah, that, that, that's huge that you, that you preface with take away those things. Those are very emotional things, but real things. So as a pilot, if my schedule is not intact or if it changes or if my pay goes up or down or I compare my, we're pilots, I'm going to compare my pay to my buddy at United, my buddy at Delta, my buddy at FedEx, my buddy at Spirit. It's just what I'm going to do, right? And those are that emotional piece like, oh, he gets paid $3 an hour or more. This place sucks, right? I mean, that's that mentality sometimes. I've been there. We've all been there. Don't make fun of me. Um, so take away that. I take away just that emotional piece that a lot of our pilots probably see. Remove those 14,000 employees, and you look at every other employee that, that governs Ameri or that runs American Airlines, which is over 100,000 people. It's an amazing corporation. It's huge. Do we have bad apples? Yeah. Do we have bad apples in our pilot corps? Sure, we do. Do we have amazing people? Absolutely. For those that have the fortune, pilots are very unique. We're almost like independent contractors. We say. We're going to train you for a month and a half how to fly this multi-million dollar jet. We're going to give you the pseudo keys, right? I, I just learned yesterday. By the way, you guys don't have keys in archers. That was fascinating. Um, <laughs> it's like a real airplane now. So we're going to give you this humongous multi-million dollar jet for four or five days and say, have fun. But the caveat is you must bring it back in the exact conditions to give it to you. What other job has that responsibility? None, right? And we expect you to make mistakes. We just don't expect you to kill anybody or crash the airplane. So it's a humongous level of um, responsibility. The other people that come to work every day, they get to come in at 8 o'clock and leave at 4 o'clock, see their family every day. But when you walk into these buildings we have, you know, we have a gelato shop, a Starbucks. They have free lunches going on. You go downstairs and you have made-to-order Indian food. You always have some pasta dish. You have some protein thing. It's not just the burger and fry place, right? They've really made it this, this place to welcome anything and everything. We have you know, maternity rooms finally. We have prayer rooms finally. You, know, you talk about diversity and inclusion stuff. We're embracing that to like bring in anybody and everybody. And not that we look different, we have different gods and that kind of stuff, but different ways of thinking, right? If you hire 20 Tonys, are we gonna improve? No, we can't have 20 Tonys. We gotta have you know, one of everybody kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it's a phenomenal culture. Um, and I think if you break down the emotion and the honesty of most American Airlines employees, they're going to tell you the same. My, my goal in life has always been to work for a corporation where I can put that hat on and go mow my grass and not be like ashamed of it. And I've worked at some really bad corporations, and I've worked at some really good ones. Now, as pilots, the worst thing is, oh, you work in American? Well, in Dallas, like, you, throw, you throw a stone, you hit like eight Southwest pilots or eight American pilots. But is a pilot, like our friend Mike there, he's a United guy. If he's in Denver, they say, oh, you work for United? That last time I flew on them. You know, people's perception of our corporation is they're one bad experience, right? And that's every airline has those. So we just try to limit those. And um, yeah, I, you know, minus my two-year furlough, the last 14 years have been amazing. Um, going through, um, my brother passed away while I was on my first trip on the 190. The way that airline handled me, it's funny because I, I was at my good friend's house, who's also UND alumni in the Twin Cities, and I got the phone call, and I had to call my parents, and I called my chief pilot, I said, Jim, I'm freaking out, man. Hey, my brother just died. I'll get the airplane back tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to swear what he told me. But he used a four-letter word and said off, so fill in the blank. Um, I said, Tony, stop. Here's the phone number. Call, um, and it's going to get you home. Basically, you call this number and say, hey, you have bereavement. They're going to get you home. By the time I had landed back in Charlotte, he had already personally called both my parents and got all their arrangements for them to meet me. You don't get that everywhere, right? So, I mean, that alone, my personal experience of how they've handled the like, birth of my daughter, I mean, it's, it's been phenomenal. So, yeah, I think it's an amazing, amazing culture. Sorry, I'm long-winded on answers. Well, thank you. I want to give you the whole spectrum. So, and they give me a paycheck every two weeks. It hasn't bounced yet, so. <laughs> Do we have time for one or two more? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Who else? There's something I wanted to know for a while is, um, let's, Let's say I live in uh, Charlotte, uh -huh. and um, I know sometimes the airlines would choose where you're going to start off, or they kind of get it. I don't really know how that works. Well, let's say you have to move somewhere else. How does, would that work? Will they give you a place to you rent yourself or something like that? So every airline's a little bit different. So at American Airlines, when, when I go to New Hire Dinner next Wednesday, we're going to send a lot of pilots to New York. We've never not sent new hires to New York City. Um, 
so New York will be your base, right? And let's assume you get New York or LA. Those are our two junior bases. One, cost of living, and two, it's, the flying is just, it's crazy. So um, let's say you go to New York, and let's say you live in Charlotte. No, we don't give you anything. You're, it's going to be your responsibility at that point to, to commute up to New York. Now, you, you have the opportunity to move. We're not going to pay any moving expenses. That's all going to be contractually stuff that some airlines may. I know we don't. So the idea is, hey, you're qualified. When you have to go fly, you just have to catch a flight up to New York before you start your trip. And then when you get done, you, you commute back to Charlotte. And then, you know, some of us commute, some of us don't. I live, I live in a base. I've commuted on and off in my career. It's not for me. I wouldn't recommend it. But some people have to do to other needs, right? So if you have family somewhere and you need to be there, that's, just an, that's something you're going to have to do. Um, but if you can eventually get base, like for Charlotte, I think it's only taking guys right now seven months to get back to Charlotte. For seven months, you're going to commute, and then you'll get back to Charlotte at some point. Thank you. You bet. I hope that answered your question. We're cranking them off now. Next. Oh, we got one of the DFW people now. So you had said that. Hold on, we got to congratulate Mace. Big round of applause. You got a CFI yesterday. <laughs> Sorry. He might blush. <laughs> Thanks. But you had said that your biggest regret, uh, or one of your biggest regrets in your life, was not showing up for that hockey uh, tryout. In your airline career, what has been your biggest regret? Oh, man. I don't, I don't have, like, I, when I go through my life, like, I just have this mentality where I don't, if there's an opportunity, I go with it. Um, there was a time in 2013, I was at Airbus FO, and the merger with American was just announced. And we didn't know what that meant. We just knew it was going to happen, hopefully. Um, and it was, OK, do I go to the right seat of something big, 757, 767, 8330, which I wanted to do so bad. Who doesn't want to go to Europe for 30 hours and fly one leg back with a cappuccino machine and hot fudge sundaes? I mean, it's amazing. Or do I go fly the ERJ 190 and become a captain for the first time in my career? And I'm like. I chose that path, right? And I look back, my friends that have done the international, they've done Asia, they've done South America, I want that, right? It's that sense of adventure I want. Now, I go to Anchorage and Key West, which is cool, and I go to like Bogota, Colombia, we go to Hawaii. That's all really cool, and I love domestic flying, but that longing, and that'll, that'll happen at some point in my career, hopefully, uh, assuming I stay healthy. Um, so I guess that might be the only thing, but it was, it was a path like awesome or awesome. I chose awesome. You know, but it still would have been awesome over here, too. But I look back, too, like, if, if you live with regret, um, these other jobs I've done in, in the levels of management, which I've really, really enjoyed, um, would have those opportunities presented itself if I had I not been a, a captain on the 190? No. I would have done something, but I don't know what that would have been. But I'm pretty darn happy with kind of what I've done so far. Anybody else? We need another hard one now. Evan's getting the steps in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for my question, how did you go from being a like, captain on the E-190 to then being a check or a chief pilot and then for A320 chief pilot? Um, so I guess the path was, so it was Airbus FO. I went to the, become a captain on the 190. One of the, the jobs I left out, um, I guess it was November of 13. Merger was coming on, and um, one of the gentlemen that I had interviewed during my master's degree about AKP said, hey, do you want to come do some special assignment work during the merger? I'm like, I don't know what that is, but sure, why not, right? And it was basically running our, our US Airways LOSA program, uh, managing that, and then it led into traveling to Dallas Tuesday through Thursday to do risk assessment as we managed. Because guess what? American had a bunch of pilot manuals, so did US Airways. Somehow we had to create new ones. So we had, at every change we did, we had to do risk assessment and present that to the FAA. So that's kind of what that became. Um, so I was in Dallas just doing different stuff at learning American Airlines. Um, and again, there you meet people, your relationship, they see the work you can do. Um, and as the merger was ending, I didn't know what I was going to do. Hey, I'm going to be a 190 captain. Rock on. That sounds fun. Um, and they said, hey, we're going to look to hire a 190 check airman. Would you be interested? I said, sure, why not? That sounds fun. You know, I love flying that airplane, both seats. And um, it'd be great to share my excitement with a new FO or upgrading captain. Um, so that became that and did that for two and a half years. Again, based on um, 
I guess, my work. They said, hey, there's going to be a chief pilot opening in Chicago. Do you want to do it? I said, holy smokes. You're going to hire a U.S. Air kid to move up to Chicago in an American base? I'm like, I'll interview. My wife's like, yeah, we'll move to Chicago. Uh, didn't get the job. Um, our vice president of flight was the director then, and he said, you did really well. You're the number two candidate. Would you be interested in moving to Dallas? Um, I said, oh, my God. I need to go talk to my wife. I don't know about Texas. So I went to talk to my wife. She's like, why not? Let's go to Texas. So I interviewed down um, in, in Dallas, and they hired two of us. And that was just, I always say yes. That's probably a fault of mine. <laughs> you know, I, I love saying yes to new opportunities, right? It's, it's that call to adventure. Like, the idea, I was 37 years old walking in as the first U.S. Airways pilot to be a chief pilot in the world's largest American Airlines hub. And when you go through mergers, there's, there's cultures, there's, um, there's chips on shoulders, there's, there's unknowns, right? And we get defensive, so it was like, who's this U.S. Air guy, right? It was super fun walking in there. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any of the American stuff. And I'd never flown to Dallas. Like, well, I did a U.S. Air like four times. I didn't know anything. You just, you just be humble. You work hard. You figure it out. And, um, and then again, when the safety thing came up, my, a good mentor of mine uh, who's got a year left, he, he said, you know, I'm going to go fly for my last year and a half. Um, so the VP of safety called and said, hey, would you be interested in coming over to do safety? I said, I don't know. Let me talk to my wife. You know, what's that entail? What's the workload? What's the daily schedule? On-call stuff. Um, I reg <laughs> regrettably said yes to that one. That was, a, that was a, a heck of a job. And I did it for about a year. And it was just, it was really fun. I learned a lot. But, um, and then I, I initiated my return to being a check airman. I went to our, our, um, our director of training and said, hey, I'm kind of done with uh, the safety stuff. I, I need a break. I, want to go. I really miss flying. Because when you go into these other jobs, a chief pilot, safety, you don't get to fly. I flew a three-day trip every month as a chief pilot. That was a big piece for our chiefs. You have to be credible. You have to fly where your pilots fly. But safety, I'd be lucky if I got you know two, three legs in a month. And as a pilot, somebody that loves to fly, I came here not to become a chief pilot. I came here to be a pilot, right? I miss just like, I'd go out and fly. And I was not unsafe. But I could feel like, man, I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel like I should. I, I like to be a master of my craft. So that was my decision to go back and be a Czech Airman and go flying again. So that's kind of my path. And I don't, I don't know what that next opportunity is going to be, but there's going to be something, and I don't know what it's going to be. I'm excited to say yes, though. Thank you. You bet. Spence, you got a quest? You good? OK. All right, well, I think that's, that's it. questions. Give a round of applause. Mate, one, one more thing real quick. Um, so we talked about mentorships and relationships. I'm going to ask Rob and Mike to raise their hands. So these two gentlemen, both of my era, Rob 737 captain at American, uh, Mike 787FO instructor at United. Don't be afraid to talk to them. So build some relationships, guys. Thanks for coming.